Well, I think it was a process of development. Uh, it wasn't all there from the start. The, there were clues and there were, there were potential opportunities. But I remember, uh, I, I think it was the very first episode we were filming after the pilot when we started into production, that there was a scene in which the ship was being threatened by some outside problem, some outside dangerous force. And there was a lot of activity on the ship. The captain was saying, do such and such, press this button, do this, warp three, get us out of here, and so forth. Other people are reacting and scurrying around. And I think I'm remembering correctly that Spock had one word to say, and the word was fascinating. And we're looking at this thing on the screen, you know, and everybody else is reacting, oh, look at it, blah, 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 blah. And I got caught up in that energy, and I said, fascinating. And the director said, uh, give me a brilliant note, and said, uh, be different, be the scientist, be detached. See it as something that's a curiosity rather than a threat. Thank you. I said, fascinating. Well, a big chunk of the character was born right there. And when the producers and writers would see that kind of thing happen in the film the next day, they would start to write to that. And when they'd see some little friction between McCoy and myself, he the humanist and me the anti-humanist, and it got to be funny, they'd write to that. So the characters started to develop. But I began to realize that, that there had been a, a precedent for this kind of character in a movie called The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, Michael Rennie, the actor, <clears throat> portrayed a character who comes from another planet who is extremely intelligent uh, and, and not human, quite detached from the human experience. Uh, a cool, rational, thinking, mysterious, peaceful person but very powerful, uh, who came to Earth to say to the people of Earth, you're headed for trouble, and, you're, and, you, and if you on Earth get into serious trouble with your atomic weapons and so forth, you could be creating problems for other planets. Be careful, beware, watch what you do. There was a, a lesson for me in that, in that kind of work. I, I talked about at the time being heavily influenced by what I saw Harry Belafonte do on stage one night in a performance at, uh, at an amphitheater here, the Greek theater here in Los Angeles. I was a big Belafonte fan. I, I loved his work, his musical work. Later he became an actor. But I, was, I loved his musical work. And I went to see him at a concert one night. <clears throat> and I was, I was really affected by the fact that for the longest time, he came out on stage, in a, as I recall, in a blackout. And spotlight came up on him and he was there. Big ovation, Harry Belafonte, the star, hot. And he just stood there very quietly. And he sang applause, next song, stood there quietly and sang. And then he must have been on stage, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. And in the middle of maybe the second or third song somewhere, arm went out like that. Some gesture. It was like, wow! <laughs> it was gigantic because it had become, it had come from a very minimal place. It had come. He was just standing with his hands on his thighs, kind of slightly hunched the way he used to do, and sang. And when he made a gesture, it was like the whole place shook. Wow, what a lesson. If you are minimal, then that becomes a big deal. If you are minimal, that becomes a big deal. You make a comment with an eyebrow that's just as powerful as throwing punches. You know. So I learned, I learned a lot from that. Uh, I, I went through a process of, of gradually, gradually internalizing, internalizing more and more and more and more and more. And there were times when I have to remind myself, that's because that's, that wasn't my nature. My nature, on the contrary, my training as an actor was to use my emotions, to use gesture, to use color in my speech, uh, to use tonalities to be interesting and to be passionate. I always enjoyed being passionate as an actor in playing passionate characters. So this was quite a, quite a shift for me. It wasn't me at all. This wasn't me. It became me. I adopted personally some of the, some of the attributes of this character uh, because I enjoyed them. I found them com comforting and comfortable. And because by osmosis, I picked, I picked it up. I was in that character when we were shooting the series. I was in that, in that character more than I was in my own, uh, if you figure the number of hours in a week. I was there from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 to 7 o'clock at night in character. 
and then I'd be home for a couple of hours at night before I'd go to sleep, and I'd be, uh, I'd be out of character on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. But a cumulative number of hours, I was Spock more than I was Nimoy. So the character gradually, my character gradually shifted. I think that, that moment that I mentioned, <clears throat> that fascinating moment, was, was a, big, uh, a big step. And uh, I also, <clears throat> I got feedback from the producers and writers that, that gave me clues about what was working. I have a natural tendency, always did, to do that, to respond with an eye. I just, I never thought about it, I just did. And uh, I, I guess I must have done it in a scene where somebody says something, and I just, that was my reaction. And on the next script, the next week, I see where a writer had written, somebody says something to me, and it would say, Spock lifts an eyebrow. So I thought, oh, that's working. <laughs> it's, they're getting it, you know. And I would, and then I would start to play to that. Then there's always, it's a pendulum swing. Then you'd say, well, God, they've got me doing an eyebrow on every page. You know, I'd say, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> let's not kill it. It works, but let's not kill it. 